Isaiah chapter 42 and verses 1 to 4, please. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Amen. Amen. Isaiah, he is the Lord's prophet to Judah. Uh, In the first 39 chapters of his book, uh, he has admonished uh, the people for their waywardness. And their eventual fall is predicted because of their unfaithfulness. That is coming. Uh, Chapter 39 uh, closes with these solemn words in verses 5 and 6. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. The Lord is holy. He is just. He cannot allow their constant unfaithfulness to go on forever. The Lord God, he reigns supreme. He is the one before whom the holy angels hide their faces and cry, Holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah's writings record all of the Lord's solemn warnings that were given to him and the certain predictions and indeed the gracious invitations to repent and return to him. And the Lord knows what's happening. He knows that his people are still worshipping him with their lips. Their hearts are far from him. They're doing all their religious rites and ceremonies and sacrifices, but their hearts aren't right. Their hearts aren't clean. And already the Lord has spoken with that uh, two-edged sword that we have uh, coming out of Christ's mouth in Revelation 1. Mercy and justice. Isaiah 1, 18 to 20, familiar words, I trust. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Such gracious words, really, over all that call to come and repent and return to the Lord. But they were unheeded. And Judah went on. It it, it followed in the path of of Israel and it fell. 586 BC. But the words that were given in time by Isaiah, they they were written down. uh, And not just the first 39 chapters, but all of it. Chapters 40 to 66 as well. Because more words from the Lord followed. uh, Words that would be preserved and then read in captivity so we have chapter 40 it opens with comfort yes comfort my people says your God and the comfort that is held out to God's rebellious people is the promise of a divine saviour they were to live in hope of the coming Messiah even though their circumstances were that of captivity and punishment and guilt and depression Because they only got what they deserved. Still they were to hold on to hope. God's deliverer would come as promised. But could they do that? Could they really do that? Could, Could they hope in God's divine deliverer? Because he would be that. He would be God. He would be infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. The Lord would not change his law to accommodate his less than perfect people. His law is based on his own holy character. 
the Lord cannot and will not change any of his perfections. And they had failed to live up to his standards before. So is there any realistic hope that they can do so now? When they're reading, you know, this preserved word of God in captivity? They're there as punishment for their own sins? How would the Lord treat them now? How could they even, you know, look to the Lord after all that they have done? How could they look at this promised deliverer and find hope? And yet that is the very thing that the Lord wants them to do. Behold my servant. That's what God wants us to do. Behold his servant. Behold the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew in chapter 12 quotes these verses. uh, And it's made very plain. It's Jesus himself. But notice here from Isaiah 42, some things. Uh, God calls him my servant. Jesus is uh, sent from God into the world as a servant of the Father. But he's equal with God. The same in substance, equal in power and glory. And yet, for our sakes, he obeys the Father and takes on the role of a servant. And his glory and majesty is hidden He comes in humility, and not just the humility of a stable outside Bethlehem, but the humility of a cross outside Jerusalem. Paul says in Philippians 2, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So it is in his humiliation, Christ became completely dependent on his Father. He came to live for us. He had to live as one of us. He had to live in our place. He had to die in our place. And we're told here that he was upheld by God in verse 1. Father held the Son in his hand. He came and he lived as one of us, as the servant of God. Notice, secondly, he is God's elect one, the chosen one, the Messiah, the anointed, anointed by God to save his people from their sins, chosen from before the foundation of the world to be our Savior. He's the perfect Son of God. He's the one in whom God delights. Uh, God has delighted in his Son already for all eternity. But in our salvation, there is this unique delight as the Father watches his Son humble himself to save his people. The Father delights in this. Uh, We see that delight when we consider that God put his Spirit upon him uh, at his baptism, marking the beginning of his ministry. Both the Father and the Spirit, they identify with the Son. Uh, Matthew three sixteen and 17, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God is delighted. Always, of course, delighted in his son, but he's delighted specifically now that his son is taking on this task, this role of a servant, so that he would save his people. And through his son, the promise was made here that he would bring forth justice to the nations. And yes, there would be justice for the Assyrians, for the Babylonians, and for the nations who fought against God's people. That was going to come. But what about Judah? What about Israel? Have they not already gotten their justice? They're languishing in captivity. How can they sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Oh yes, once they stood tall and proud. Now they're beaten down. Once they were on fire, they were unstoppable and the kingdom was expanding. Now the fire is all but gone. What hope do they have? 
Behold my servant. What's he like? Verse 2, he will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Doesn't bark orders or shout at us. His way is not to panic his people with threats. Doesn't raise his voice to dominate them. He doesn't self-advertise or make his voice heard on the street. He's not like that. He's not aggressive. He's not threatening in that way. Quite the opposite here. He's gentle. Verse 3, the first part, a bruised reed he will not break. Maybe you're there tonight. Maybe you feel a bit battered and bruised. Maybe it's because of your own failures and sin, like Judah, like Israel. Or maybe it's because of the Assyrians or the Babylonians. You know, others, others have hurt you. And yet here we have every encouragement to behold the Lord Jesus. His desire is not to break you, but to help you and to strengthen you. Verse 3b, and smoking flax he will not quench. How's your faith in God tonight? Are you aflame with zeal for the Lord? Are you telling absolutely everyone you meet about the Lord Jesus and their need of him? Is your life of prayer one without ceasing? Do you rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. See, maybe it's more like a smoldering wick. Oh yes, it's, there's heat there. There's a, there's a little smoke, maybe a little flame. Behold the Lord Jesus. His desire is not to condemn us for little faith. He's not there to extinguish that little bit. His desire is to keep you burning. His desire is to gently you know, fuel the flames with his unfailing love. Cast yourself upon him. Cast your cares upon him. He cares for you. Only behold him. Look to him. Don't doubt him. Don't imagine that you're too far gone. Too bruised now. Too extinguished for him to help you and strengthen you. Verse 4 makes a promise. He will not fail nor be discouraged. Aren't we there a lot? Don't we fail? All the time. And we end up discouraged quite a lot of the time because of our own failures. But here we're told, look, take your eyes off yourself. Behold my servant. He won't fail. He won't get discouraged. And he's gentle. Yes, he is the divine servant of the Lord. And he will establish justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. But praise God, our justice has been established at the cross of Calvary. The justice fell on my sin and your sin, believer, when Christ hung there and our sins are gone. He has carried them for us. They've already received justice poured out on our Saviour. And now that grace, it it needs preached to the whole world, even to the isles, to the coastlands. So let's pray for that tonight. Let's pray for that gracious justice of the gospel to be preached and received. Let us pray that many more would behold the servant of the Lord. But first of all, we must look to him ourselves. It's only when we behold him, when we see him as he truly is, it's only then that our hearts are encouraged and strengthened to live for him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for a moment, please. Lord God in heaven, we thank you that by your grace we can behold 
the servant of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that he became a servant for our salvation. We thank you, Lord God, that justice has been served upon our sins. Lord, it is a miracle of grace that we're still here. But it's only because Christ has paid the debt for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We behold you. And we behold you in your wonder, in your splendor, in your justice, and in your gentleness. We acknowledge, we feel, and we get cast down. We're so glad you don't. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would be patient with us still. And please, help us to keep our eyes fixed on beholding the servant of the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.